Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Um, today, in defiance of Donald Trump, in defiance of the State Department, in defiance of Mike Pompeo, this woman just wrapped up over nine hours of testifying before the House Investigating Committee. Yes, that's a long time. Her, her name, her name is Marie Yovanovitch. Now, she is a career diplomat. She's got multiple foreign postings. She has language fluency. And she's also the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. She is the one, and you may have sort of seen this when that call first came out, right? She is the one that the president kind of threatened infamously in the call with the Ukrainian president. Remember that part? It is very weird. It's kind of gross, frankly. Donald Trump, he's talking about how bad his own ambassador is to the president of Ukraine. And he says, she's going to go through some things. Okay. <laughs> now, she already lost her job earlier this year. She was recalled as a U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Basically, it appears because she kind of stood in the way of this corrupt shadow foreign policy that the president and his bag man, Rudy Giuliani, had cooked up. So she was an obstacle to their scheme to coerce a foreign government into manufacturing dirt on the president's political rival. And so they had to get her out of the way. And so she was sent back to Washington, D.C. very abruptly. In fact, I think you can tell the whole story of this scandal and indeed the whole Trump era as kind of story of two archetypes. All right. The bag man, Rudy Giuliani and the civil servant, Marie Ivanovich. Right. So the civil servant, Marie Ivanovich, she shows up today to talk to the House Investigating Committee. She is still let's be clear. She is still an employee of the State Department. OK, her livelihood, her paychecks every other week, they come from the State Department. At the last minute, the State Department said you cannot show up. But she showed up and basically said, here I am, fire me. OK. <laughs> And Marie Ivanovich, the civil servant, put her career as a diplomat, as a foreign service officer on the line. She put her livelihood at stake today. And she did it because she wanted to come and deliver a message to the committees about the way that Donald Trump is corrupting the American government. She told the committee today there was a campaign of disinformation that was waged against her and that that campaign worked. She was abruptly recalled, told to come back to Washington, quote, on the next plane. She was told by her boss, the number two at State Department, she had done nothing wrong, that this was not like other situations. That's a quote, which is surely the case. She even said that Rudy Giuliani's buddies, okay, the guys that were just arrested, remember them? <laughs> they probably saw her as an obstacle and wanted her pushed out because they wanted to make money in Ukraine. And of course, uh, she was standing in the way. She was referencing these two guys that were arrested yesterday trying to flee the country hours after having lunch with Rudy Giuliani at the Trump Hotel. A weird set of events. <laughs> Marie Ivanovich had an entire campaign waged against her because she stood in the way, she says, of this corrupt abuse of power that's fully coming into light. And she is a civil servant who, I think, based on her testimony today, based on people that have worked with her, views her role as serving the American people and not Donald Trump himself. Someone that I know, someone that I know, a source who works with her in an official capacity, uh, said this to me. 
Never ever said a cruel word or a wrong thing, just the perfect example of a public servant. So in this story, she stands in, I think, for a, a kind of person in our government and in our political community that is the enemy of Trumpism. It's the kind of person that Trumpism must destroy in order to triumph. She's a public servant who views her duty as doing her best for the country she serves, which is true, I gotta say, of the overwhelming number of people in the civil service of this nation, from the FBI, the USDA, the Energy Department. If you interview them like I have as a journalist, if you have people in your family, they are really on the whole, I mean, some of them are good and some of them are bad and some are all in between, but they're on the whole, they are people who are trying to represent the interests of the United States of America. Not the man who happens to be occupying the White House. Which is a distinction. And the thing is, Trumpism cannot see that distinction, right? Trumpism cannot deal with those kinds of people because Trumpism is all about subverting the country and the public's interest, the public trust, all of us, to the whims of the man Donald Trump. Trumpism cannot be implemented by civil servants. Doesn't work. Trumpism can only be implemented by lackeys and by bag men. Bag men like Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani, who by the way does not work for the US government. He does not draw a government salary. He has no official role in American foreign policy. He answers to one person, that is Donald Trump. Donald Trump has anointed him personally to do his bidding. He is Michael Cohen 2.0. Before he had Rudy Giuliani, it's, it's really true. Before he had Rudy Giuliani, Trump had Michael Cohen. And Michael Cohen was the president's fixer and his bag man. He took care of hush money payments and he took care of real estate deals and he took care of keeping things out of the newspaper. And now, well, Michael Cohen is in prison. So he can't use Michael Cohen anymore. So he's got Rudy Giuliani, right? Rudy Giuliani, it, he's not really his attorney in any like real sense. He's not like writing legal briefs that are going before courts. The president has real lawyers to do that, believe me. He's in court a lot. The lawyers take care of that. <laughs> Rudy Giuliani is just a fixer with a law degree. And he has apparently been tasked with a pretty clear mission by the president, which is to manufacture dirt on my political enemies so that I can get reelected. Instead of running a foreign policy for the people of the country that represents our collective interests, Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani are running and have been running a shadow foreign policy that has nothing to do with the interests of the United States. I mean, <laughs> that is basically what Donald Trump told the president of Ukraine, right there, right? Clear as day in the White House call notes that they released. After he said, I would like you to do us a favor though, right? The key part of that phone call, the ask, the ask. He goes on to tell the Ukrainian president that he has to talk to Rudy. Basically saying, Rudy's great, highly respected guy, great guy, mayor, he's my guy, give him a call. Talk to Rudy, talk to Rudy. Donald Trump brought up Rudy on that call multiple times because Giuliani was his guy running his scheme. And that scheme started well before the call. We know that now. If you go back and you look through the months before the call, the shadow foreign policy is all right there in front of us. Rudy Giuliani is running point to pull off the scheme and he's got to get rid of the person in his way who is the civil servant Marie Ivanovich. Because she takes her job seriously as the ambassador of Ukraine. She is not there to implement some corruption. So then Rudy and his associates, what do they have to do? They got to get rid of her. So they start this crazy pressure campaign against her, right? They enlist their allies to talk about how bad Marie Ivanovich is. For instance, here's the president's son, okay? Who, co color me crazy, is not, I think, super into the details of which foreign service members are posted to which locales generally. And suddenly Don Jr. has a strong opinion about who the Ukrainian ambassador is and calling for her removal. Where does that come from? Rudy Giuliani is whispering in everyone's ears about how they need the, that dirt on the president's political enemies. And in order to get that, they got to get rid of this obstacle of Marie Ivanovich. She has to go. And he's tweeting about how Ukraine has to open an investigation to the Bidens. And then he puts together this crazy propaganda folder of conspiracy theories attacking Marie Ivanovich, attacking the civil servant and the Bidens, and he sends it over to the State Department in this weird envelope with some calligraphy. <laughs> he did this, he admitted to it. That makes it sort of seem like it came from the White House. <laughs> As the return address, just the White House. <laughs> and the intent clearly is to give them the message 
that this is coming from the president. It is coming from the president because it's coming from the president's bag now. Circulate this around. Know who this person is. Rudy's job was to run this entire corrupt policy for Donald Trump. Coerce a foreign nation, an occupied foreign nation, and a mask manufactured during his political opponent. That was his mission. That was his goal. But here's the thing. That is not an American goal, right? It is directly counter to American interests. The public national interest, our interest, collectively, as citizens, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, all of us together, right? Our interest is for American elections to be decided by Americans. Not by some Ukrainian prosecutor. Donald Trump's interest, his particular interest, is for foreign countries to interfere on his behalf like they did in 2016. That's in his interest. And so that, that is what Rudy Giuliani did. And now, as the sheer scope of this thing keeps getting bigger and bigger, they are all desperate to cover it up. But the problem here is that there are more Marie Yovanoviches out there. Believe me. There are dozens of people in the government who really do view their duty to be the country and not to Donald Trump. And it is just a matter of time for them to come forward. Like the first whistleblower did, and now the second. There is only one bag man, and he, gosh, I don't know what his future holds. <laughs> but there are many civil servants like Marie Ivanovich who are not afraid to stand up and to tell the truth. It is Monday. The 14th of October of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. Well, um, by turns, the weekend uh, could have been comical and also sadly tragic, knowing what we've done to the Kurds as these images come in. I just cannot stand it. I cannot look. I've never been uh, one to mull over gore. And uh, video proof of the assassination murders, the, the brutal, gory murders of politicians and, and media, press, in the theater there, call it the theater, is much more than I can handle. So this uh, this uh, video, this parody, the right wing is calling it a satire. No, it's, it's I suppose a parody would be the proper term. Satire does not cut it in this instance of uh, Trump uh, apparently being in a, as a mass killer at a church and where he's killing Black Lives Matter people and the press and it's stupid. I started to watch it but I couldn't watch it anymore I don't like that stuff you know I've never really been I was never enthralled with the the gory monster movies that you know after midnight on the TV in Southern California growing up oh you didn't have those when you were growing up because you had video games huh Nintendo well when I was a kid they would have uh, all the monster movies on uh, starting at 11 o'clock uh, in Southern California. I believe it was a uh, uh, chiller thriller or something like that. But there were several on the more independent channels. You had the three major ones, but we lived in a media mecca. And uh, so you had a few others. So, uh, but my friends, oh man, they just loved all that stuff. And I wasn't really into it. So, uh, I didn't, I got to tell you, it took me a long time to warm to Peckinpah because Peckinpah's movies were a little too gory and violent for me. You know, I, I think I was probably well into, well, I wouldn't say well into, but I was in my early twenties by the time I actually started, uh, deconstructing the wild bunch and uh, a few others. So, um, that said, this uh, stupid video of, you know, made by Trump loyalists, by the way. Now I've heard from a former vice, no, <laughs> he's a former vice journalist, uh, that apparently, you know, this video is a year old and why aren't people upset about it? Well, because it wasn't shown at a major Republican Trump event. Okay, that's why. Jeez, no wonder he's a former vice journalist. But, um... 
So uh, this is put out there for a number of reasons by Trump loyalists, granted. But I have my suspicions because active measures are active measures. Mm -hmm. Whether they spontaneously arise on their own because, uh, you know, the, the codes are put out there, you know. Anyway, so uh, uh, some have speculated that this is a way of distracting us from the fact that Trump is, quote, a, oops, that Trump is, quote, a traitor. Don't hit the microphone while you're on the air. Um, that Trump is a traitor, that uh, uh, we have to keep focused on that. And these distractions will keep us. And I do understand that concern. But um, I don't think that it's peculiar to me, but we should be able to multitask. And if anything, this Trump parody vid of a snuff vid is, well, I got to tell you, further evidence of what a, quote, traitor he really is. Now, the White House has come out and uh, at least by the time I put myself in the bubble here, because you got to, I got to stop bringing in the new news. And uh, what I last heard is that they said that Trump has not seen the video, but if it's depicted as it is, well, he would roundly criticize it, which is code for he's seen it. He likes it. The only thing he's upset about it is why he wasn't. Recorded, uh, I, I endorse this ad. I am Donald Trump. I endorse this ad. Um, that's the only thing he's upset about. But because, and I got to tell you, that conversation right there, that phone call right there, the audio recording of that phone call, the transcript of that phone call went into that, that uh, top secret server. <laughs> Boy, they know which side their bread is buttered. They can't let that stuff get out. <laughs> but we know how the conversations are going now. So that's the least of it. Because the press, and rightfully so, is in an outrage over this. I just wish there was more of an outrage about the graphic snuff videos made by the Turks of them killing brutally in the most gory fashion politicians and journalists on the side of the road. And laughing about it. Um, it would be nice if there was a bit more outrage about that. Because the repercussions of that is going to be very brutal. And it is by design. It's a feature, not a bug. Of course he wants ISIS to go back into Europe. Of course he does. He wants Paris trains attacked every day. And maybe there'll be some off-duty or, or some Marines on R&R on the train and they can protect us. And Clint Eastwood can make a movie about it later. Oh, good. So, <laughs> that's the weekend I had. How was yours? What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, of course, Maria Yanovich was removed from her post because she was an obstacle to the corrupt shadow foreign policy Trump and his bag man Giuliani cooked up. Because it's not just about the Ukraine. What is going on with Erdogan was something long in the making. Let's remember that. On the rest of the menu, a federal judge blocked the Trump administration from denying green cards to poor immigrants. Well, good. A Trump-appointed judge claimed Congress cannot investigate a president installed by a hostile foreign power before impeachment, but a majority of the court disagreed with her. Well, I guess she delivered on exactly what Trump put her in there for now, didn't she? And Trump officials want to gut the White House foreign policy staff by 50 percent. So Trump's phone calls are no longer impeded by stupid things like the Constitution and the rule of law. After the break, we move to the chef's table 
where Bill Barr is running the Department of Justice like it's a legal arm of the Trump Organization and maybe even an enforcement arm of Opus Dei. And what do Trump's sister, retired appeals court judge Mary Ann Trump Barry, and Trump appointed Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh have in common? They both escape the consequences of their misconduct. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is our chat room link right there by the social media scroll. Kelly Link and monitors that for us. Thank you, Kelly. To the left ish of the page from the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon site or the page, Patreon page. And all kidding aside, Please do become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, though uh, how we fund this resistance endeavor here, uh, most of it comes out of our own pockets, our own wallets. We would still be unable to do this without you, and your generosity over these eight years has allowed us to do that. And uh, since uh, we are now up to eight years, four years ago, we had to get some newish machinery and phased out the other workhorse. You wouldn't believe the small, tiny machine that we started on. But, um, uh, yes, the mothership needs some newish machinery. They get worn out over time, and all the software starts degrading. What the hell? So your generosity is allowing us to accumulate those funds to get that newish machinery, and oh, boy. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, we would truly be unable to do this without you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is so simple. Just go to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. I, of course, take care of at Justice Putnam. You could follow me there if you'd like. And I also post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime and get and then get that linked up on social media so you can have your social media linkage. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, really wherever podcasts can be found. We're there. We're every, there, We're with everything. It's out there. We're in the W's if you're going to go alphabetically. You don't have to start at A. You can just go right to the W's. W-E even, maybe. Okay. Well, let's take a look at this first offering here. Um, there's so much more to rant about, but I suppose we should go with the curated show since it's on the menu. Okay, this is uh, this is out of uh, the Associated Press by way of ShareBlue Media. A federal judge in New York has temporarily blocked Donald Trump's so-called public charge rule, a plan to deny green cards to many immigrants who use Medicaid, food stamps, and other government benefits. U.S. District Judge George Daniels' ruling on Friday prevents the policy from taking effect uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, October 15th. The Trump administration had proposed that immigrants be disqualified from getting legal U.S. residency if they were likely to become a burden on public welfare programs. Punish the poor, especially if they're brown. The injunction puts the policy on hold while a lawsuit over the policy advances. The lawsuit in New York is one of several legal challenges nationwide to one of Trump's most aggressive steps to cut Legal immigration. Legal. 
Advocates say the rule changes are discriminatory because they would deny legal residency and visas to immigrants who don't have money. Now, of course, I know a lot of white people are saying right now, well, yeah, (laughs) forget about the fact that maybe your great granddad came here through Ellis Island with less than a buck in his pocket. How many times have we heard that before? In August, Ken Cuccinelli, acting director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and he acts like a neo-fascist in that role, I got to tell you, came under fire for his response to questions about the public charge rule after he revised the words from the poem, The New Colossus, at the foot of the Statue of Liberty to be less friendly to poorer immigrants. Would you also agree that Emma Lazarus' words etched on the Statue of Liberty, Give Me Your Tired, Your Poor, are also part of the American ethos? NPR's Rachel Martin asked Cuccinelli at the time. They certainly are. Give me your tired and your poor who can stand on their own two feet and who will not become a public charge, he said, notably adding to the famous poem. I wish Cuccinelli at least knew something about rhyme and meter. Lisa Needham of Share Blue Media brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. At the first opportunity, Judge Naomi Rao tried to do what Trump put her on the second most powerful court in the country to do, run interference for Trump. On Friday, the D.C. Circuit issued a ruling in Trump v. Mazers. That's the case about whether Trump can stop his accounting firm, Mazers or Mazers, from giving his tax returns to the House Committee on Oversight and Reform as part of its investigation into Trump's finances. The Oversight Committee has argued that its investigation underpins a larger inquiry as to whether Congress needs to amend disclosure and ethics rules. Trump has contended the committee has no right to investigate him because it's looking at his underlying criminal behavior and it should only be able to do that in an impeachment proceeding. Really now? Well, the majority of the court didn't buy that at all, holding that, contrary to the president's arguments, the committee possesses authority under both the House rules and the Constitution to issue the subpoena and Mazur's must comply. That's an order from the court. Rao, whom Trump picked to replace Brett Kavanaugh after he was elevated to the Supreme Court, disagreed. She penned a 67-page dissent that is untethered from actual law and serves only to prop up Trump's reasoning. It's not a big surprise that a judge who had no previous judicial experience is a rape apologist, and brags about gutting regulations that would side with Trump. Rao's underlying conclusion is exactly what Trump says, that he cannot be investigated by Congress outside of an impeachment hearing. Of course, Trump is refusing to cooperate with the impeachment proceedings as well. But that's another matter. Rao writes that, The most important question is not whether Congress has put forth some legitimate legislative purpose, but rather whether Congress is investigating suspicions of criminality or allegations that the president violated the law. Such investigations may be pursued exclusively through impeachment. The House may not use the legislative power to circumvent the protections and accountability that accompany the impeachment power. 
in case her stance wasn't clear enough. Elsewhere in the dissent, she writes that when Congress seeks information about the president's wrongdoing, it does not matter whether the investigation also has a legislative purpose. Investigations of impeachable offenses simply are not and never have been within Congress's legislative power. Well, these statements not only have no basis in law, but Rao makes no attempt to say that they do. And the majority opinion calls her out on it, noting her dissent identifies nothing in the text, structure, or original meaning of Article 1 or Article 2 of the Constitution to support such a sweeping rule of legislative paralysis. Rao's stance, the majority says, would mean that Congress must either initiate the grave and weighty process of impeachment or forgo any investigation in support of potential legislation. It's that legislative paralysis that is precisely what the Trump administration is going for. He's declared that the House cannot investigate him because it touches his underlying crimes. In other words, his and Rao's argument is that if a House oversight investigation turns up criminal behavior on part of the president, it has to stop investigating. That sounds like a mobster would want something like that. The majority points out that the Supreme Court precedent already says otherwise, and that a congressional committee which is engaged in legitimate legislative investigation need not grind to a halt whenever a crime or wrongdoing is disclosed. While the effect of getting Trump's tax returns may be a determination that he broke the law, the committee is investigating whether any of his actions warrant strengthening ethics and oversight rules, a task wholly within the legislative purview. The existence of impeachment cannot possibly mean that a House committee must immediately commence impeachment the minute its members suspect wrongdoing. Ralph's stance is absurd on the face. But it also highlights a key problem with the Trump era. The laws didn't anticipate a president who would be gleefully, continually, and openly engaged in wrongdoing. The Congress and the courts did not anticipate that a possible defense to Trump's crimes might be an assertion that he cannot be investigated for those crimes the minute anyone in the House suspects he committed a crime. The victory of the D.C. court is sweet, but may be short-lived. Trump can ask the entire court to rehear the case, or he could appeal directly to the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, there, he likely has at least four solid votes. Gorsuch, Thomas, Alito, and Kavanaugh. Who will share his view that he cannot be investigated? That leaves Chief Justice John Roberts, who has already proven, when gutting the Voting Rights Act, that he's willing to overturn key constitutional provisions without saying what part of the Constitution is actually violated. West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press. Anonymous worker bees there because that's how they do it. Donald Trump's new national security advisor said that he wants to reduce the White House foreign policy staff by half. Robert O'Brien said that during the Obama administration, the number of staffers swelled to more than 100. 
He told employees at the National Security Council Town Hall late Thursday that he wants to bring the staff level back to where it was when Condoleezza Rice was the National Security Advisor for G.W. Bush. That was about 100 staffers to give policy advice to the president and help implement his decisions, O'Brien said on Fox Business's Lou Dobbs Tonight. And that was with two wars going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, of course, when you're running illegal wars, you don't really want advice from law-abiding citizens now, do you? The size of the NSC has fluctuated over the years. O'Brien did not say how he planned to cut the staff. Many staffers are detailed to the NSC from other government agencies, so the reductions could be made by not replacing them when their tours are over or when they return to other agencies. According to CNN, the NSC cuts were ordered by Trump, who was, quote, frustrated and damaged by leaks of information that he suspected came from an agency staffers seconded to the NSC. Really? You mean government servants whose task is to protect the Constitution of the United States from enemies, foreign and domestic and they are following the rule of law. O'Brien himself did not focus on leaks as the reason for the cuts and said no one is being specifically targeted, but one White House official said that leaks are a primary reason for driving the change. We're not talking about leaks to the press. We're talking about talking to congressional investigators and oversight. Those kind of leaks. You know, by career civil servants who are tasked with protecting the Constitution of the United States of America from enemies, foreign and domestic, with no quid pro quo. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we are going to go through weather from around the world and finish up the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, back in the day, there was a time, not that long ago, when political leaders wanting to do shady or illegal things at least attempted to keep them secret. Such a time was in the run-up to the Iraq War, which is the backdrop for the new whistleblower drama Official Secrets, which takes its name from Britain's Official Secrets Act and, like its American counterpart, the Espionage Act, often tempts politicians to misuse to hide misdeeds from public scrutiny. In Official Secrets, Catherine Gunn, played to a T by Keira Knightley, is a low-level GCHQ intelligence analyst who comes across a memo from the analogous U.S. agency, the NSA, apparently seeking the Brit help in a scheme to blackmail smaller nations into supporting the Iraq war at the U.N. Moved by the egregious nature of the memo, she decides to leak it to the press, setting the stage for personal, national, and even international drama in a movie that combines the best of legal and press procedurals with an intensely personal story of an ordinary person with whom we can identify, growing in the resolve to stand by her moral convictions and the truth. Supporting nightly here are Ralph Finnis as Ben Emerson, the human rights lawyer who took her case, Doctor Who's Matt Smith as the lead correspondent at The Guardian, which was also targeted by the government, and Adam Bakri, Gunn's immigrant husband who was cruelly made a pawn in the whole affair. Director Gavin Hood, who gave us 2015's drone warfare expose, Eye in the Sky, likes shining lights on places governments don't like them shined, and Official Secrets keeps that going. A maybe too happily ever after rap is followed by a strange, seemingly ancillary scene on a beach that will plant you back in political reality. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube.
This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Social media platforms like Facebook use a combination of artificial intelligence and human moderators to scout out and eliminate hate speech. But now researchers have developed a new AI tool that wouldn't just scrub hate speech, but it would actually craft responses to it, like this. The language used is highly offensive. All ethnicities and social groups deserve tolerance. And this type of intervention response can hopefully short-circuit the hate cycles that we often get in these different forums. Anna Bethke, a data scientist at Intel. The idea, she says, is to fight hate speech with more speech, an approach advocated by the ACLU and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. So with her colleagues at UC Santa Barbara, Bethke got access to more than 5,000 conversations from the site Reddit and nearly 12,000 more from Gab, a social media site where many users banned by Twitter tend to resurface. The researchers had real people craft sample responses to the hate speech in those Reddit and Gab conversations. Then they let natural language processing algorithms learn from the real human responses and craft their own, such as, I don't think using words that are sexist in nature contribute to a productive conversation. Which sounds pretty good, but the machines also spit out slightly head-scratching responses like this one. This is not allowed in untimed to treat people by their skin color. And when the scientists asked human reviewers to blindly choose between human responses and machine responses, well, most of the time, the humans won. The team published the results on the site Archive, and they'll present them next month in Hong Kong at the Conference on Empirical Methods in Natural Language Processing. Ultimately, Bethke says, the idea is to spark more conversation. And not just to have this discussion between a person and the bot, but to start to elicit the conversations within the communities themselves between the people that might be being harmful and those that they are potentially harming. In other words, to bring back good old civil discourse? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I would go that far, but it sort of sounds like that's what I just proposed, huh? (laughs) Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. Occasional aches and pains are an expected part of life, but for many people, pain is a constant companion. Dr. Chad Helmick is with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He's joining us today to discuss ways to manage chronic pain. Welcome to the show, Chad. Thank you. Chad, how many people in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain? In 2016, 50 million adults had chronic pain, which is pain on most or every day in the past six months. More interesting, though, is that 20 million people have high-impact chronic pain, which is chronic pain that also limits their work or life activities on most or every day in the past six months. This is a problem because chronic pain is associated not only with symptoms, but with anxiety and depression, reduced quality of life, and the risk of opioid problems. What are the most common causes of chronic pain? The most common causes generally relate to bones and joints, like low back pain and arthritis, but there are many other causes, headaches, sickle cell disease, fibromyalgia, surgery and injuries, and many, many others. Is chronic pain more common in any particular group of people? Yes, it's, uh, it occurs at all ages, but it's more common in um, older middle-aged adults and in the oldest old, 85 and older. It's also more common in women, poor people, and those who live in rural areas. How is chronic pain treated? Well, the first thing to do is to get a diagnosis, which can help guide treatment. But the thinking about chronic pain now is that it becomes a chronic disease by itself, regardless of the cause, and that can cause significant problems. The real goal in management is to have a manageable level of pain, not to get rid of all pain. There are several steps that can be taken, and these are sometimes difficult to do because of barriers to access. But it makes sense to do the simplest and safest things first. And these are non-drug steps, things like physical activity. Walking is perfectly good to help reduce pain. Also, self-management education can give you some confidence in managing chronic pain when you're on your own. There's also physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological therapy, better sleep, which usually means less alcohol, and seeing a chiropractor or getting biofeedback and massage. 
If that's not enough, non-opioid drugs like Tylenol or Motrin and Advil or Naproxen or Aleve can help. If those don't work, then it's time to consider something stronger. Sometimes that's opioids, but there's not great evidence that opioids are good for long-term pain in most people. Do you have any advice for people suffering from chronic pain? Well, it's important to work with a variety of providers who are working together to help you. Uh, The goal, again, is manageable pain so you can live a productive life. This can include physical therapy, most people can walk, to treat any underlying depression or anxiety, and to avoid further injuries. Finally, the National Pain Strategy is laying out a strategic roadmap to improve pain management system in this country. Where can listeners get more information about managing chronic pain? Listeners can go to the NIH website, nih.gov, and type in National Pain Strategy. Thanks, Chad. I've been talking today with Dr. Chad Helmick about ways to manage chronic pain. If you're experiencing daily pain, talk with your healthcare provider to ensure you have the correct diagnosis and know how to manage your condition. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Kathleen Dooling for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This is a message from CDC. After hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods, standing water and excess moisture help mold grow in your home, garage, and other structures. When you return to a home that has been flooded, know that you're likely to have mold. Mold puts your family's health at risk. If you have mold growing in your home, you should clean it up and fix other water problems, such as leaks in roofs, walls, or plumbing. Keep your children and pets out of affected areas until you've cleaned. Control moisture in your home to prevent mold growth. To remove mold growth from hard surfaces, use commercial products, soap and water, or a bleach solution of no more than one cup of household laundry bleach in one gallon of water. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Never mix bleach with ammonia or other household cleaners. It will produce dangerous, toxic fumes. Open windows and doors to provide fresh air. For more information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. What does high crimes and misdemeanors mean? Here's a quick synopsis. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Article 2 of the Constitution, which sets forth the powers and limitations of the executive branch, the presidency, says, quote, The president, the vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Treason is defined in the Constitution, and bribery is pretty well understood, but high crimes and misdemeanors, well, not so much. First of all, the word high refers to the office, not the crime. A high crime is committed by someone in a high office. And the word crime does not mean a criminal offense. And misdemeanors, as we understand the word today, has nothing to do with impeachment at all. Indeed, a high crime or misdemeanor need not be a violation of any criminal law, although it could be. That's because the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors, as understood at the time the Constitution was adopted, was a technical term, a term of art. It encompassed a range of behavior by high officials, an abuse of office, a violation of the oath of office, a violation of the public trust, an offense against society. At a time when impeachment is being considered, we thought that reviewing the applicable standard might be helpful. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. 
On this day in labor history, the year was 1933. That was the day that the Executive Council of the American Federation of Labor decided to call for a boycott of Nazi Germany's goods and services. Jewish labor leaders in the United States led the push for the boycott. They were alarmed about the news coming from Germany since Adolf Hitler had taken over as Chancellor that January. The day after the boycott decision, American Federation of Labor President William Green spoke with a reporter saying, We found fresh justification for our action yesterday in today's announcement of Germany's withdrawal from the League of Nations and Disarmament Conference. In the months that followed the boycott, Jewish labor leaders continued to organize. In 1934, they formed the Jewish Labor Committee, a new organization headquartered in New York City. That year, the head of the Jewish Labor Committee, Baruch Charney Valetic, addressed the convention of the American Federation of Labor in San Francisco. He urged for more union action. In response, the American Federation of Labor founded the Labor Chest. The fund was established to aid in refugees fleeing Nazi persecution. It was also to support public education about the rising threat of fascism. In 1936, the AFL's chairman of the labor chest, Matthew Wall, declared that the events in Germany, quote, concern us as deeply as the cause of labor and that we shall spare no effort to help the victims of this regime. That same year, the Jewish Labor Committee organized a World Labor Athletic Carnival in New York City. The aim was to draw attention away from the Olympics that were being held in Nazi Germany. American Federation of Labor President William Green served as one of the honorary chairpersons for those games. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. We always begin the weather from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 48 degrees Fahrenheit, slated for a high of about 73 to 75, nearly the same as it was yesterday. Overnight lows should remain in the mid to upper 40s, and the daytime highs should remain in the, well, uh, low to upper, low to mid 70s. What am I, where am I? Some clouds this morning will give way to generally sunny skies in the afternoon. afternoon. Winds light and variable, and clear to partly cloudy overnight. Winds will remain light and variable, and also light and variable tomorrow, with intervals of clouds and sunshine in the morning. And then by Wednesday, we're looking at about a quarter inch of rain. And, oh uh, boy, it looks like maybe an inch and a half after that, over the course of the next three, four, five days, possibly. We'll see. Maybe two inches of rain in all that time is what I'm adding up. Boy, a quarter inch each day. Yeah, that could add up. All right, let's see here. Oh, uh, ragweed pollen is moderate. The air quality index is good at 36 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is moderate at 4. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.3 inches. Visibility is at 7 miles. And relative humidity is at... 94% weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. All right, London is 60 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 77 and sunny. Rome is 77 and partly cloudy. Kiev, oh, by the way, Kiev is spelled K-Y-E-V, or K-Y-E-V, I believe now. It's no longer K-I-E-V, apparently. We'll see how long that lasts. I'm sorry, Kiev is 70 and fair. Kabul is 65 and fair. Hong Kong is 76 with a rain shower. 
Tokyo is 61 and cloudy and still picking up from a typhoon where a lot of people died, by the way. Sydney, Australia is 63 and clear. San Francisco, California is 54 and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 64 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. And that is Weather from Around the World, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Terry Schwaden of DC Report brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. When the smoke finally clears from the impeachment morass, we'll still have the case of the Justice Department that Attorney General William P. Barr has turned into a personal law firm to protect Donald Trump. There have been almost daily developments showing that Barr's Justice Department has been extending its efforts to provide both justifiable and legally questionable efforts to shield Trump, to pursue investigations into the actions of critics of the president, and to interpret anything in the legal area in Trump's favor. In short, Trump has become more Trump's lawyer than America's chief criminal law enforcement officer. Indeed. When Trump's presidency eventually ends, a critical look back will be the destruction of an independent Justice Department. And uh, then the reporter uh, lists, uh, wow, about a dozen instances in which Barr has pretty much violated the law. When do we start an impeachment process on this fellow right now? Nancy, you can drop the papers. Now, put all together, add in details like allowing the White House to park incriminating transcripts in a specialized safe for top secrets, lightly stir and you come up with a singular conclusion. Bill Barr is not enforcing criminal law. He is protecting the president. And I should mention as well that he was at a, uh, uh, was it North Dakota? A law? So he was, oh, I'm sorry, Notre Dame, North Dakota. Notre Dame speaking to the law school there about uh, uh, the destruction of the moral fabric and core, Americans' core American values and morals, were destroyed by secularism, which is sort of code word for Jew. But really, even more than that, he's talking about the Enlightenment. That's secularism. Yeah. Because, as far as I can tell, the destruction of American morality tracks exactly with the rise of the prosperity gospel. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, reste toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne. Christopher Broshley of Common Dreams brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. One, one went up and one went down. Each enjoyed similar benefits as a result of their travels. Brett Kavanaugh and Marianne Trump Berry. Now Brett ascended to the U.S. Supreme Court and Mary descended from the U.S. Court of Appeals. And their travels enabled them to escape the consequences of their misconduct. Now, of course, we know all about Brett. Who paid his bills? Let alone the scores of accusations of sexual misconduct. Over 
many, many years. Now with Marianne, her misconduct is uh, pretty much uh, uh, capitalizing on her brother's, her younger brother's, criminality. And that's the way it's going to (laughs) be. So they both got away with it. Just as they were about ready to investigate her, she retired. And just as they were about to investigate him, he made it to the Supreme Court, where he sits to this day, judging the quick and the dead. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period of the day. But you do know that Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on, so do stay tuned. And, uh, in fact, we're going to meet up here tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Du frais d'Aster, revoir un latte coël. Je voudrais toujours te plaire dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je veux déjeuner par terre, comme au long de golf clair. T'embrasser les yeux ouverts dans mon jardin d'hiver. Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver